Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Christy Martindale. Christy is the Chief Product Officer for Sarcos Robotics. Uh, Christy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Spencer. I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled to have you on. We've been talking about this for several months now, so I'm excited we finally get to connect. I'm sure you're a really busy woman, so no, no worries. Appreciate yeah, sorry about time. that. It, it did take a little bit of time. A lot of travel. As soon as uh, the pandemic kind of eased up, I thought we would ease into travel, but that did not happen. We were right into the deep end. Brutal. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, I, I had a buddy at NASA, and I remember him talking about them compiling a list of, uh, and I say had because he's no longer with NASA, but uh, the reason um, I bring it up is they were compiling a list of everybody that had their vaccine, and his strong suspicion was those people were just going to be on every conference, every single board meeting, every, you know, like, get, hey, get in the plane. We're ready to send you over there now. So. Yeah. Here's your hazmat suit. Good luck. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, just because I've never met anybody with your background um, yet, uh, what does a chief product officer do and, and how did you become one? Great question. So. Thanks. My primary focus and responsibility on the product side of it as a chief product officer is to set the roadmap and the plan for our product evolution and development. So uh, I have a number of groups under my um, purview and the product management team is the product piece of the chief product officer. And they're responsible, that team is comprised of a lot of different people. So there's product managers, there's applications engineers, uh, there's UX design people, oh, there's cool. human factors people, uh, industrial design. And really, um, when I look at my whole job, because I also have the marketing piece and product marketing and IR and PR, so there's a lot under my umbrella. And the way I like to look at my job is I am really responsible for making sure that we deliver on the customer's expectations. So delivering a product that's really going to delight our customers and excite them about uh, changing the workforce with our product offering. Sweet. That's really awesome. And I, I, I did snoop your LinkedIn before we started. So you, you came from more of a marketing background, right? So I, I feel like I may have misintroduced you, and I'm sorry to anyone listening. Um, I believe, Christy, also, you had up marketing as well as product, right? I had up marketing. I had a product. And I do have a heavy marketing background, but it's probably not the traditional marketing that many people think about. I think when people think of marketing traditionally, they think of the things you see outwardly, the brand, the logo, events, and things like that. And while my team does do those types of things, I've always lived in the more strategic marketing. So I started as a technical writer early on in my oh, career. Cool. Did, did, you know, wrote manuals, wrote product manuals. And that led into me writing the feature specifications of a software offering for a point of sale. And then I ended up doing technical training and implementations and installations of these systems. So my background, um, I came up through the technical side of the business, not the comms are the creative side of the business. So I'm probably a little bit more of an unusual uh, marketing person, if you will, in that I think most people think of marketing more on the creative and, and brand side of it. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I know I used to work for an ad agency and I probably had that misconception as well. So that's, Yeah, that's I'm not the person you ask about, you know, color science, because that wasn't my gig, but I love <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've got designers on your team who could answer that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, no, yeah, my passion has always been, again, being from a more, I, it was a science week. I wanted to pursue science and then realized I needed to have a PhD to make any money in biology. So tech, uh, I was fortunate to fall into it and I love it. I love the intersect of tech and humanity and sciences and and really that application and how those things all come together. So I um, fell into essentially my dream job and being able to work on technology, but also use my analytical skills and writing skills and, and strategic thinking about how you make all these pieces work to solve a problem. That's really cool. Um, yeah. So I guess 
just to just kind of stay with that thread for a bit, um, when was that moment where you sort of were like deciding between, you know, biology or, or tech and, and what did that look like for you? What kind of pushed you over the edge in that direction? So interestingly enough, uh, when I was in college, um, I was studying sciences and then realized it's like, wow, uh, if I'm going to make more than, you know, a dollar an hour, <laughs> I'm going to have <laughs> HD in biology, <laughs> that's going to take some time. So I changed majors and I uh, got a Bachelor of Science in Business. So nice. I really just went into the business side of it. And then when I um, graduated and started working, uh, I started as a technical writer. So that's how I got into the technology piece is uh, apparently I had halfway decent writing skills and uh, started as a technical writer, and that then was kind of the baseline and foundation. I have a, a natural curiosity. I love digging in and hanging out with the engineers and really figuring out, you know, how it works and how to translate a lot of what they're saying, those, the technical jargon into the, the so what, and hopefully in more understandable, relatable English. <laughs> Um, so I really enjoyed um, immersing myself in that. And then I always um, took opportunities as they, as they came about. I didn't, you know, say no or, or shy away from a challenge, whether I really fully understood it or not. And so I did the, you know, I was doing the technical writing and they said, oh, well, how about if you, you know, find the feature specifications? I'm like, oh, sure, why not? <laughs> 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 and then that led to, you know, well, why don't you, um, you know, do the trainings and installations? And I'm like, huh, well, sure, I can try that out. And, you know, it wasn't things that I had a background for, but I just jumped in with both feet. And then eventually they asked me to run marketing um, at this company. And then that kind of set my trajectory. And then being so passionate about technology, I always stayed in technology sector. So I think he's mentioned reading my background. Early days, I started again at point of sale, but I've done point of sale software, supply chain software, e-commerce software. Um, and then even how I got into mobile, I live in San Diego. So I really wanted to get into wireless and understand the wireless sector. So I worked with a woman who had a lot of work with Qualcomm, and then I got a job at one of their um, companies that they owned with Microsoft. It was a joint venture between Microsoft and Qualcomm. And just tells you how old I am. Uh, the charter for that company was to uh, use cell phones to send email. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, what do, you do after you accomplish that? <laughs> you look up. Guess we're, I'm uh, done. We're You're done welcome. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome world. <laughs> so yeah, so that um, that tells you again now that I've dated myself and, and I'm walking into the Smithsonian here. Um, so yeah, those were the ah, early days uh, of, of mo mobility and technology. And then that company, Qualcomm bought it out and um, was pulled everything into what I call the mothership, so the core Qualcomm company. And again, there, I, my career, same thing. I I would have an opportunity and I would just do that more. And I really try to dig in and understand and, and go spend time hanging out with the engineers and seeing how things worked and, and also having um, those relationships across the organization. So when I got into Qualcomm, I was working on one of their earlier businesses that was a little bit more staid. Um, you know, it was one of, it was their cash cow. It was really had funded. It was their original business, but it was a little bit slow moving for me. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I like uh, really hyper competitive, uh, hyper fast growing markets. And so Qualcomm was really great. And I would say they don't, um, they don't really go and compete in markets. They create markets because the technology is so bleeding edge. And so got a call one day from somebody uh, that I'd worked with at uh, Wireless Knowledge, which was the email on phones company. And they asked me to come work at, um, come set up the whole marketing for a broadcast technology that the company was building. So did that for about seven years. And again, I kept, as I worked with people and as I just took on new challenges, I. I would get more and more. At one time, I explained it to somebody. If I don't know if you're a cook or not. But I love to cook. 
So you know the difference between uh, cooking a lobster and cooking a, a frog, right? <laughs> so <laughs> the frog you put in the cold water and it stays there because it doesn't realize it's, anything's coming and you turn on the heat and eventually the frog is cooked. Well, that's kind of the way my career was. They just keep piling things on. It's like, oh, hey, do you have time? I need you to work on this or can you do this? Or, you know, the famous, oh, I just need you 10% of your time when you had 0% of time to give to anybody. <laughs> all right, I'll help you out. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you have a whole new division that you're responsible for. Oh, so. <laughs> So at times it was uh, when I try to explain my career or my job at Qualcomm, they'd ask me what areas I was responsible for. And when I got through the list, they go, oh, your job kind of doesn't make sense. And I go, no, it really doesn't. But I love it. I never, every day was different and <laughs> new challenge. <laughs> That's awesome. So you were just good at stuff and you kept getting piling on is what it sounds like. And you know, I think it's passion. Yeah, good or, you know, really um, there's no... There's not even 100% in my world. It's like, I'm all in. I'm 120%. I really like to attack those challenges. So it's not easy for me to just kind of partway do something. I really have to to dig in and understand it and, and really help to solve the problem. And I think um, that's one of those things that uh, people valued, I think, in my career and that I was helping them to be successful in, in what they were trying to accomplish and achieve. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. I know I want to work with somebody that cares about what they're doing pretty much every single time. So, That's Yeah, awesome. exactly. And so that kind of, I mean, after I had a great career at Qualcomm, did all kinds of amazing, wonderful things. I, it's Sometimes I think back and I pinch myself. I, now you hear about augmented reality as as an example, well, I launched, uh, it was called Euphoria at the time, it's now part of PCT. Um, and that was, I don't know, maybe had, it had to be 12, 13 years ago, which again, dating myself. And now to see those things come to life in a well, The technology has gotten so good in the last several years. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But I remember being on that forefront, you know, and we're sitting there going, okay, so wow, what do we do with this? How are people going to use it? And creating those visions and creating that environment and creating that that story and that evolution that helped create that demand and draw and helped people realize where that opportunity or where that technology could help be an accelerant or a supportive role in, in their business growth is really exciting. So how do you do that? How do you take a tech that doesn't even really exist yet and project like markets for it. You know, it's funny you ask. I remember when I was coming into Sarkos, uh, I was talking to Ben Wolf, who was the CEO at the time. And he asked me something similar because we were still developing products at Sarkos. And he goes, well, how are you going to, you know, the, it doesn't exist yet. We're still working on it. And I go, well, if we're being honest, Ben, for the last 13 years, I've marketed air, right? What a CDMA or 5G or <laughs> It's just like, I've, I've marketed air. So um, <laughs> uh, for me, it really is um, understanding the tech first, right? And often um, the engineers have a vision and, and they can really help in the applicability. They talk in technical jargon, but if you speak to them long enough, it's, you get, what's the so what? Help me understand or, or tell me why that matters or, what problem is that solving? You learn to ask the questions that are going to get you the answer you need. Nice. And you take the pieces of their vision and then you scan the market. Uh, you really look around and see what's out there. You do your market analysis, your competitive analysis. Is there somebody already solving this problem? If so, how? And then if, if what is your differentiator? You know, finding that white space of opportunity that you can go attack. So you put all this stuff in the blender and out your your plan and your strategy if only it were that easy um <laughs> but it just takes a lot of time and research and talking to people and it really um pursuing that curiosity pulling the thread asking one question and the follow-on question i tell people uh everyone loves to talk about what they do and wants to share so 
I find that if I want to know something about an industry or space, I'm not afraid to to reach out. Some of um, our companies that we're working with now are Lighthouse customers. I saw them on a podcast or on a, a you know webinar, and I'm like, well, hey, they said I could ask questions, so I'd shoot them a note <laughs> in and say. Uh, have I got some questions for you? <laughs> and, you know, have a conversation and understand, really understand what their pain points were and what problems they're trying to solve in their business and how they look at those things and how how they rationalize it from a business perspective and, and not trying to push technology, but really understand the problems and the pain points that people are trying to solve. And that almost sounds really similar to sales. I mean, at least if done correctly. I know sales gets a bad name because of <laughs> crappy sales tactics. <laughs> well, are, certainly sorry. it's all part of one big team, right? Like you, sales and marketing are worked closely together when they're trying to create that demand and pull for the, the technology. But um, I, I do think sales gets a bad name because I think people think of the, the used car salesman, right? People yeah. always go back to that and um and yeah that i don't think is the way certainly not well, how I, I i remember i was shopping the real estate market like a year or two ago and um i was looking for investment properties and and this agent asked me you know she's like what are your uh what's your price range so i told her and you know and she's like all right well you know what neighborhoods are you looking at i'm like I, you know what's gonna earn me money on a rental property <laughs> She, you know, so she shows me this one place and I don't think she really understood my market because she was like, well, just, isn't it beautiful? I'm like, I don't care how beautiful it is. You know, what does the market for renters look like in this particular area? She said, what do you mean? I'm like, are they students? Are they nurses and doctors? Are they, you know, young professionals, the teachers? Like, what, what does it look like? You know, and she had no idea. And then she had the, the balls to show me an exclusivity agreement. And I'm like, why would I ever sign that? <laughs> like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, but yeah. then for every, you know, person like that, or maybe for every like three people like that, you get one really, really awesome professional that, you know, acts as an advocate for you and listens and talks to their own engineering and tech team and understands what you need and helps you get it. And so I feel like that's, maybe the difference between the type of business tactics you're talking about and the type that people associate with, you know, used car dealers. And so, yeah, I think we've all experienced that. Right. And, and, um, it's like when I, I don't know if you garden or if you call it yard work, but it's yeah. the same, same thing, right? Marketing or selling, you don't feel like you're being sold to, you're not being marketed to if it's something you need and you want. So, you call it gardening if you enjoy being out there. You call it yard work if you don't like it. It's junk mail. <laughs> it doesn't appeal to you, and it's not, you know, addressing your needs and how you're thinking and what your challenge is. It's then junk mail, right? Yeah, <laughs> it makes sense to me. Useful and informational. So, so do you believe, like, and just to kind of follow that thread, do you do you think marketing emails can ever have a place, or do you think that's superfluous and not really a good tactic? Well. It's interesting you say that. I think we have, so AI is a big deal now, right? Sure. And I think one of the challenges with marketing is in some cases, the automation is so good that it's probably very difficult for people to market to me because I see it all the time, right? And I know it's sense. like, okay, a bot, a bot sent this, delete, 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 right? So, in fact, unsubscribe, um, block. <laughs> Get, get out of my inbox. <laughs> yeah, and um, but it was interesting because um, I I very rarely respond to them. But again, if it resonates and it speaks to a problem and a pain point you're having at that time, you likely will, or you'll send it to somebody who will address it, right? And so I think it is if you understand your audience, if you're really segmenting your message, if you're speaking in terms that are value and benefits to them. And that requires homework. You can't just guess, right? That go means you're talking to the target market and you're really digging in and understanding how you might have a value proposition for them. And when you're able to pull those things together and really speak to them in their language about their pain points and how 
you are helping to address those, it's a different exchange and it's a different dialogue. Interesting. So you'd still, in that case, be doing cold outreach, but it would be much more researched and therefore you would increase your probability of success and also, you know, maybe be more courteous to the recipient. Could be. Um, and, you know, cold outreach, uh, we do things a little bit. We don't do uh, what I call shotgun marketing. So we're not a consumer product. We sure. don't do broad advertising. We don't need an ad in, you know, on CNBC or whatever. That Because we're, our products are very specific to specific markets. So what we do in the product marketing side and product management is really understanding that customer journey. And as part of that customer journey and the audience, and who is it? Is it the operator and the user of the, the product? Is it the economic buyer? Who are the decision makers in the journey, right? And then we really go through and understand each of those decision makers, there's something that matters to them. So if it's the economic buyer, say a financial CFO, they care about the ROI. How are you going to make me more efficient, cost less money, whatever those drivers are for them? If you're talking to a health and safety person, they want to know, how are you keeping my team safe? How are you reducing injuries on the job? How are you helping us to in, you know, enable our workforce so that they can be healthier for a longer period of time? Yeah. If you're talking to a user of the product, they want to know, is it comfortable? Is it easy to use? Is it going to help me do my job better? Is it taking my job? And then they don't want to hear that, right? So really understanding each of the constituents in the buyer's journey. And then the job of marketing is to really understand those constituents and then create messaging that resonates to those folks so that it means something when they see it. And it may or may not um, be something that is the right time, and it may sometimes miss the mark. Maybe their pain point's a little bit different than the research you've done. And, and Interesting. You test and learn, and you evolve. But we don't just do everybody. We really try to understand the market, understand the journey, understand those targets. And then you go and you say, okay, well, it's going to be the person that's going to buy this is the health and safety person at um, this type of of company and the company size might be between here and here and you focus and you find those people and then you do outreach. To cool. Teams. That makes a lot of sense. Just to go back to something you said earlier, I really did like that you, uh, you have application engineers on your product team. I thought that was incredibly wise. And I don't know if that was your decision or if that's routine and customary in this industry or kind of how you, you arrived there, but I, I, that kind of perked up to me and I, I was sort of interested in how that came to be and how, how that works. Well, um, how did that come to be? Well, and I don't know what's customary in our industry. I, what happened is um, when we were first transitioning from an R&D company into a, a product company and a commercial product company, um, there was really need to have very finite product definition, right? And to do that and to have agreed upon plan of record for a product, we needed a product team. And so um, I pushed and pushed and said, we need a product team. And I wasn't pushing for me to have it. I was pushing because we needed it. And then yeah, it uh, might have been my boss telling me to shut up and said, okay, go solve the problem then. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> again, and sometimes the mouth and you get more work. But anyway, yeah. um, so part of that, um, I identified somebody to come in and, and we worked together to define um, the product management team. And as part of that, as we're going through evolution and our customer base um, is pretty varied and Again, in understanding what that customer need is, there's uh, two reasons we have apps engineering uh, in my organization. The prime, well, I don't know that it's primary, they're both pretty equally important. One is really understanding um, the customer and the customer use case and the task breakdown to make sure that there's a good fit for the product to help them solve their needs. So helping them understand product capabilities, 
really understand. And when I say task breakdown, it's really going through their workflow and understand, okay, does this fit here? Does this fit there? And then the other part of it um, was making sure on the things that um, didn't require the deep, deeper engineering group, we could keep the engineers on task, right? They didn't have to be distracted by marketing or sales or product people asking all these questions about, oh, can we do 2% turn here when an uh, applications engineer could quickly go do that work. So they're a little bit of a bridge uh, to help bring that technology, that hit that technical analysis in and, and help uh, buffer the engineering team from having to chase a bunch of. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes sense. I mean, as an engineering manager, a lot of times uh, I'll have the engineering team just asking me to keep various stakeholders off their backs. And so it's kind of funny. How it seems to pervade like every company. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Especially tech companies, right? And um, yeah, and I think engineers love to talk about their work, but then at some point they realize, holy cow, I can't get anything done because all these people are knocking on my door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's been that's been my experience as well. Or like there's there's one uh, individual I've worked with a lot in my career now. Um, they just be like, just keep the customer away from me. <laughs> I'm like, all right, absolutely. <laughs> so, I don't know. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny to see that still rings true. Um, absolutely. So I, I feel like we've talked a lot, um, or maybe a little bit, I'm really enjoying it, but I've not asked you anything about what Sarcos is up to these days. And so I, I guess to give a background with my understanding of Sarcos and, and where I'm coming from, I, I've got, um, a background in robotic systems development. I'm more on the research and development side. Um, I went to Carnegie Mellon University, shameless plug. <laughs> and when I was going to school there, um, we had this Sarcos uh, robot that, you know, apparently cost a million dollars, which was a lot in that sector, uh, academia, and um, could do a bunch of different human expressions. So I think at the time Sarcos was doing uh, animatronics for Disney and a few other things. And then that was my first exposure. And then recently when Sarcos acquired the Pittsburgh company, RE Squared, uh, who my consulting company has done work with, and I, I know a few people there, um, I obviously am on a bunch of people there's LinkedIn. And I was like, oh, it's Sarcos, Are you, what's, what's going on here? And so that's, that's when I reached out. Um, and so I guess at the time I did a little bit of research and I, I watched a bunch of videos on Sarcos website and I, I Googled around and just tried to figure out what the hell Sarcos was up to and you know how out of date my knowledge was. <laughs> and so uh, it seems like you guys are doing like exoskeletons now. Like what, what exactly is, is going on? Uh, and then I've heard some great things about, I guess, animatronics robots you guys have as well that seem to be pretty advanced and, and like setting the standard there. Uh, in another project I recently was looking into. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, like what's what's hot in the Sarcos world? What's hot in the Sarcos world? So, yeah, we've been a little busy. Uh, as uh, When you were looking at Sarcos, it was probably in the 80s sometimes, not to bring you into my uh, world of uh, <laughs> how long we've been doing this, but um, you know, it was a spin out of the University of Utah in 1983, and uh, they had a long career of building um, human just capabilities in their robots, so kinematically equivalent to humans. So they did work with Disney and, and um, then from 2007 to 2014, they were part of Raytheon, uh, their division, their robotics division. So there is a lot of work that they did there. And then in 2015, there was a management buyout and uh, three of the founders uh, took um, the IP that they thought was really relevant to helping prevent injuries in the workplace. And that is through human augmentation and human augmentation robots. So in 2015 is when the company started focusing on uh, the Guardian Exo, which is the exoskeleton product and finding out and looking at how we could commercialize that um, and bring that to market. Um, it required 
a lot of work. Our early versions of uh, the Guardian XO were hydraulically powered. So, oh, interesting. Yeah, it was a lot. In 2010, it was uh, the time product of the year, but it was hydraulically powered. So from a commercialization and market perspective, it wasn't very viable, right? It I'm sure to some place. nerd at the time that was super exciting. <laughs> Well, it's amazing. It, I mean, yeah. it, I don't. If you go on YouTube, there's density. a lot of old, old videos of you know it's doing push-ups, it's running, it's doing amazing things. But um, obviously, it's been it's tethered, uh, and you can't do meaningful work. Uh, that tethered. makes a lot of sense. So I'm guessing there's an external hydraulic supply that's powering it, basically. It was then, but now, okay. so 6,800 power, 6,800 watts of power for. Um, the okay. hydraulic version. Now fast forward to where we are today, and the de- the um, exoskeleton is in development. We're planning to commercialize them. Uh, hopefully in the next year, we're working through that. Um, but um, it's now about 400 watts of power for full operation. Nice. So that's equivalent of your television. I'm that, guessing right? you peak higher than that, but that's like your create your normal operating power. It's um, doing normal work. As okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah, and so we that is required, right? Because uh, you had to be able to operate in a working environment and use commercial battery power, <laughs> package it, and run the robot. So and charge off a wall outlet, I'm sure. <laughs> so that's something that took quite a, a bit of time. Um, but along this journey, we created a group called the Exoskeleton Technical Advisory Group. And it's comprised of Fortune 100, 500 companies across a myriad of sectors. And it's senior people from those organizations of sectors that we thought would be early adopters of our technology. And during that process, again, hearing the customer, listening to customer feedback or potential customer feedback, uh, they communicated, wow, this is amazing. We want this Guardian XO. However, there's things we need to do. Could we just get the arms (laughs) going? (laughs) Well, and after we heard it enough times, what we did is we created the Guardian XT. So essentially, the Guardian XT is the top half of the Guardian XO. So it's the torso and the arms. But the key to that, the little tagline for it is any base, any place. You can mount it onto a scissor lift. You can mount mount it onto a boom truck. You could technically mount it to an AMR if you wanted ground-based kinds of of activities. So it has, um, when we talk about kinematic equivalency, Essentially, the arms of the XO and the XT work like your arms for all intents and purposes. You can move around. You, you can, um, if you, you have a wrist, this is a dock, so you can move your wrist, um, lift your arms. And so we took that and we put it into the Guardian XT, the top part, and now that can be mounted on a boom truck, and it can do at height task and why that's really critically important is because the cost for companies to have workers in baskets when there's a 30 percent premium on pay because you're putting them in this risky situation makes sense in addition to that you have a whole safety team right so you have to yeah i don't know if you've been on a work site where they cordon everything off and there's you know pylons you can't go here and then there's people with flags and then somewhere that wasn't really executed (laughs) correctly as well (laughs) right right and so you have all of these people to make sure the guy in the truck or girl the truck doesn't fall out or get hurt or somebody doesn't fall walk under and get a tool dropped on their head um, and so this is, that's how the Guardian XT uh, was uh, derived. And cool. so it's teleoperated. Somebody can be remote, uh, you know, out of harm's way. And it can do tasks such as, you know, uh, torquing or it can do oh, cool. uh, vegetation management as an industry we're looking at. So Interesting. Uh, going to cut trees, well, that doesn't sound as challenging and dangerous it is because you're cutting trees around power lines if you think about when you're having a winter storm and the trees are down and people's power is out and then all of a sudden somebody has to go out and fix that 
And often that means they have to cut the branches away from these live power lines. Well, that's not a very fun job for a, a human to do. So really uh, looked at ways that we could take an at height solution and apply it against many different industries. And so that's what the Guardian XT is designed to do. And that's um, also something that um, the Sapien product line from RE Squared, obviously they um, have a lot of arms too. So we're looking at how we, you know, take all of our products, our product portfolio, and really go back to our core mission, which is saving lives and preventing injuries. That's cool. Uh, and I, I mean, I, having looked at the Guardian line, it's probably the best looking exoskeleton I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the technology has gotten so much better. I remember is is what I thought when I was watching those videos, uh, just just doing the homework. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's that's not by accident. <laughs> like it like well, a, no, a, it's a not. Blood, sweat and tears. It is a lot of that, and you know, it's a continual work in process. But it, the the time is now, right? It took a lot of years to get components to the price point that you could have a commercially viable system to have battery packaging and power. Like batteries are more efficient; they're more powerful, right? And yeah. so. You, use those and um, otherwise I mean if batteries were giant we wouldn't be able to have a more svelte uh, exoskeleton right you'd need Makes to have sense. Something, something different and and the industrial design um, we talked about earlier there's an industrial designer on my team and that's important people this is a big machine people have to get into it and it can't it needs to be psychologically appealing right yeah. you, you to want to do this. I love not industrial you. designers. <laughs> when I was going to robot school, all my friends were in the industrial design school. And so, I mean, I read Tom Cully's Art of Innovation when I was about 12 years old. I mean, that, that field is so necessary, I think, to do good work. And so, I mean, it, it makes me happy to meet someone else who thinks that too. We, um, from the very beginning, um, we really tried to take a customer first approach to to the development um, and our go to market. So uh, that was another critical component is how you really optimize and integrate the components in a, a as seamless way as possible. That's awesome. How, uh, and, and tell me if you can't answer this, it's okay, but I'm curious. Um, how are you integrating um, the Guardian line with, you know, like the Sapien line? Like, how do you decide, you know, kind of maybe we should keep this part here or maybe we need to keep both lines because we have customers using them or you know, like, how do, how do you consolidate something like that? If you can tell me again, if you can't, we can steer clear. Yeah, I would say it's a work in progress, right? I, um, one of the things that was very appealing about, uh, the RE squared and the acquisition of RE squared is um, what we found is a lot of things were quite comp complementary. Um, there were some spaces that uh, RE squared was working in that we hadn't um, entered yet. So there's some collaborations and some segments of the market where they have arms that they created specific for those segments. So we saw it really as a complementary uh, um, pairing. And we're going through the work now of okay, which of those, like, is there a melding? And some of it is, um, you know, from a product perspective, you want to look and, and normalize as much as possible on things that can be uh, shared across product lines. Uh, software, as an example. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, the customers that, never going to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're, we're working on it and, and looking at really... Um, where we can optimize around those types of things. And, and again, looking as we did with everything and our market and our segmentation and, and finding where everything uh, fits and how that all works. Yeah, what I should have said too, is the customer's never gonna know and it's probably 75% of the product from an engineering perspective, maybe even more than that in some cases. So as a hardware specialist, I don't like to admit that, but I, I, I feel like it's so much of how these things work and you know, the really impressive stuff is all software. And again, I, I don't love to say that because I, I, you know, mechanical, electrical guy, but um, I mean, it's true. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, we need it all. And um, the hardware is unforgiving, right? So that's a hard thing to get right. Um, software, you have a little bit more 
latitude. Uh, it's you can break down. hardware pretty badly if you write the firmware incorrectly. <laughs> Yeah, As that's true. Yeah. yeah, we um, had a lot of testing in Qualcomm. You, you can brick phones and you can take out networks. So, yeah, you don't want to do that. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. And then, I don't know, especially my work in university on some of these robotic platforms. I mean, just we called it, I think, releasing the magic smoke at the time. And that term was popular <laughs> in the BattleBots that. community as well. Um, but yeah, you know, if you, if you like shorted a couple of transistors on an H bridge or which you can't really do on the stuff that's, you know, hardened six ways from Sunday to keep you from doing it. But in the early days, it wasn't. And, you know, to save money as a student, you'd solder up your own thing and it wouldn't have any of that protection in it. And you'd be fried okay. it the next yeah. day. We fried some things. It still yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, anybody that says it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> It's part of the development cycle. If you're not breaking a few things, they're probably not 100% fine. agree. I mean, <laughs> maybe there's like Elon Musk even said something about that recently, talking about like if you don't, you know, burn a rocket every now and then, you're not trying hard enough. You know, exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. You got to push the envelope. Otherwise, yeah. you never know what's possible. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, you're probably not making something new. <laughs> so that's cool. So. I guess um, you talked about the Guardian line and, and vegetation management, and I guess the obvious use case to me, and, and this is probably from an outdated place of just not knowing as much, it, it seems like, like a few years ago, like automotive manufacturers were all talking about wanting that kind of tech to repeat or prevent, sorry, repetitive motion injuries and maybe to some extent logistics companies as well. Um, but it, it seemed like the automotive companies were the most vocal on it. I guess what have you been? What have been your observations as to sort of the hot areas as the market seems to be progressing and, and people actually have these out on work sites and are, are getting to know what they're capable of? Yeah. So um, what we found there's there's a lot of dynamics and this goes back to even the market and how the market shifts, right? So um, the the um, Technical, the XTAG, Exoskeleton Technical Advisory Group I talked about. Um, there were automotive manufacturers in there early on. There's still a couple that are there. Um, and they were uh, definitely heavy proponents of, of needing um, some tools to solve some of the challenges they have. So our focus is on environments that are more unstructured, right? So unstructured environments, meaning it's not assembly line. It's not where you can install a um, hookah or something that's just oh, I some see. repetitive motion. So we really focus on what we call unstructured environments. And there is some in the automotive world for sure. There's, um, I see what you're saying. Yeah, there's things that they need to do that um, can't be automated or um are not, you know, if you're in a low mix um, or a high mix, low volume kind of manufacturing environment, then you can't necessarily automate um, beginning to end. But um, what happened during the last couple of years is um, the pandemic. Um, companies, uh, in some cases, uh, had to redirect their focus. Automotive manufacturers were hit, uh, you know, pretty hard. There's other companies we we're looking at early on that uh, they just had to kind of refocus some of their resources and energies into other areas that were maybe more core to their business and and Makes some sense. of the robotic things. Right? If you couldn't just if you couldn't put in something and get rid of 15 people, then it wasn't uh, enough, right? Yeah. And so. In some of those cases, those things are, are, are changing and coming back. But in the, I would say there's, um, for us and our focus and where we're looking at is truly those areas where automation wasn't really an opportunity before. Um, if you think about even um, a tarmac where you're out and there's, you know, different things happening with planes or, um, or if you're doing the repair maintenance on airplanes. There's these things, there's heavy items, there's dangerous scenarios, and it's not the same job every single time, right? Interesting. Or if there's a job that 
let's talk about maybe um, surface prep. Surface prep takes a lot of time and you have to install a lot of scaffolding. Scaffolding's a real pain in a lot of people's. You mean you know, for painting an airplane specifically in this case? Painting, painting um, chips in, uh, if you think about ships or even uh, tanks uh, and they have to do scaffolding. Uh, some tanks uh, require that kind of, you have to certify it. You have to make sure that the seals are still good. And sometimes that means you have to remove the paint and then you have to put another a primer and then to put another coat on. Well, to get uh, the surface off requires hydroblasting or sandblasting or something. And that work is exhausting and you have to hold these big things. There's a lot of force. Um, and, but it's not something that you're going to send a ship through the assembly line to be hydroblasted, right? Or, yeah, or yeah, of course. Blasted. And the area might be different today than the one tomorrow. And even the surface, if you think about the side of a ship, the surfaces are different each spot. So you yeah. can't really say, push a button and automate, and this is going to happen the same way every single time. The 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 job is dynamic and the environment's unstructured. So you really need a way to have a person in the loop. And then maybe there's a task within that work stream that could be automated. If we talk about the surface prep area, maybe, uh, okay, I wanna prep this area and you can push a button and that small area gets prepped and then it moves to the next thing. But there's this symbiotic relationship between man and machine to keep that intellect of the human and making sure that it can move through those environments that humans are used to moving through that it's very difficult to teach robots to do so. That's interesting. I've actually, I've never really been on a shipyard um, unless you count like walking into a yacht parking lot in the South of France <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> hey, uh, I need to hang out with you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> We're doing yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, but I, I, it just didn't occur to me that that was still such a bespoke industry. So that's interesting. I, I read a book recently about, uh, was, I think it was called Freedom's Forge. It's about manufacturing during World War II. And uh, one of the things it talked about was the ship industry adopting um, aviation industry practices to manufacture Liberty ships and creating assembly lines and unified designs that they would create these ships off of. But I guess it makes sense that they wouldn't be doing that now because a ship is such a tremendous undertaking in terms of money. And so, you know, you probably want it to be custom to justify, you know, to some extent, you know, like this is my mark on the world. And so if you're going to do all that, then it doesn't really make sense to automate like you would for a low volume, um, sorry, high volume, low mix <laughs> situation. Um, Exactly. And that's the same when, in even some of the manufacturing environments, right? It's, it's really, really costly and uh, time prohibitive to move assembly lines, change them out, right? That's why yeah. car manufacturers, they change the model, you know, once every five years or seven years. Because that makes sense. That's a huge change out. Well, and a huge I mean, the style of automation I've observed in automotive, I mean, and you've seen it too, obviously, from the way you're talking is it, it's crazy. I mean, it's like tons and tons of KUKA and FANUC and Yaskawa overhead on, you know, trains going around. And I mean, they're, they're very, very good at that particular, you know, making the same thing over and over and over again, times tens or hundreds of thousands of units. Uh, when I worked for Joy Global in Milwaukee, it's a company that makes mining equipment. I think they've since been acquired um, by Komatsu. Um, they weren't building these things that way. They were they were like four story high mining vehicles that I think they were anywhere from like five to thirty million dollars depending on the scale of the vehicle, and it followed more the ship model you're talking about. And so that's that's interesting. So if you're trying to build a giant thing, and you only want a few of it, or maybe even a small thing, but I feel like a giant thing is more conducive to an exoskeleton. Like what kind of lift capacities can you get? Um, what kind of you know? processes besides surface prep can counteract do you ever automate some of the hand motion just to sort of reduce cognitive load on the operator i have so many questions so the guardian xo uh can lift up to 200 pounds cool. um so 
um, and that's um, the operator. We, we can adjust the, what the operator feels because we found if the operator doesn't get any feedback in terms of the weight they're lifting, that could be dangerous, right? They don't know. That makes sense. Two hundred pound item goes flying across the room. Um, there's a lockout function, so the exoskeleton can lift and then hold, and then you could take your hands out and do a very finite task if nice. you wanted. Um, or you can uh, lift and m move. So uh, we're working on powered end effectors. There are three finger powered end effectors, and the design and the goal is to use off the shelf handfuls. So if you can imagine scenarios where you might need to have a grinder at one point, but then you need to move over to a needle tool, and you need you wouldn't necessarily have one end effector that did each of those things. It would be easier to have an end effector that operated more like a hand to be able to manipulate those off the shelf tools. Yeah. Um, it has a, a couple batteries that it runs off of, and it um, the goal is for it to be able to run for a full shift. Um, but what the way we achieve that is through the batteries are hot swap, hot swap. Nice. Yeah. Hot swappable, right? So you can just pull one out, stick the other one in, um, and continue running and continue and doing your job. We've also found that people, um, you know, they have breaks every two hours anyway. They're not doing that continuously. It makes sense. Um, uh, the person is standing in the exoskeleton suit, so they don't feel any load. They're not feeling the weight of the items. Um, some of the systems that you see as lift assist types of um, exoskeleton types of things, if it's upper body or just a partial body. Um, some of the findings are that the weight gets shifted from one part of your body to another. So the strain or the injury maybe then occurs in another area. Um, with our approach, we feel like that enables all of the weight to go through the exoskeleton to the floor. So it's not moving the weight and distributed to another part of the, the person's body. So we think that's a key differentiator. That makes sense. And I would think with a 200 pound lift, I mean, I mean that would hurt my back for sure. <laughs> You're doing it all the time, right? Right. Yeah. Even once, I mean, 200 pounds a lot of weight. <laughs> so. but it is amazing the things people do. I feel, I have the best job ever. I go out on sites and I talk to these people and some things blow my mind. And somebody really physically does that. Yeah, that is amazing. And even things you don't think about surface prep is not just on ships or airplanes or there's when you are driving down the freeway, I never even knew this, but the sides of the bridges that you can see, they have to be finished so that it's not ugly. Um, that makes sense. <laughs> and so there's grinding, there's sanding, they have to smooth it out, they have to apply uh, certain compounds to it. And that's people up there with tools and machines trying to do that. And if, if you think about holding something over your head for that period of time, one of the, um, you know, we looked at things. Yeah, some of the tools we have, if you ever come out to Salt Lake City or we'll probably start building them up in Pittsburgh as well. Sweet. They're amazing tools. And you think, oh, well, that tool's not that heavy. But then you go and lift it. And that's a 20 pound tool. And then you think about lifting it and moving it around all day long. You're like, oh, well, yeah, no thanks. And these scenarios, you know, at height, again, is something we're really focused on in the near term right now because it's a problem that's not been solved well. Um, and we think that we have a great solution for it. Um, but also when you talked about manufacturing, even automotive manufacturing, um, and you talked about Elon, he's, you know, probably the most highly automated um, automotive manufacturer in the world. And there's still areas that humans, I, we used to use these quotes, humans are still being used as forklifts, as you, if you will. I mean, because <laughs> there's there's rework areas for automotive that yeah. um, not automated, they did something wrong. So they have to change out doors or they have to change out tires or uh, there's things that have to be happening um, in traditional automotive. Things like the cabling and the wiring, those are super heavy and it's not easy to automate. And some things in automation. Ridiculous. Yeah, it is. And and some things when we think about um, you know, what we're looking at, one of the challenges when you have full automation, if something breaks in that flow, you're done until it's fixed, right? And if you think of 
I could give you numbers, but they're, I can't because they're secret. Yeah, <laughs> but the cost <laughs> to a company when their line is down is extraordinary. So um, there are times where, you know, some of the solutions we have would, would fit in those scenarios that you wouldn't even think about. Uh, batteries in traditional cars, those can be 50 to 80 pounds, which is amazing to me. But, um, and if there's not part of the normal assembly line, there's people that have to kit these parts and get them to the line and, and they're moving and lifting. Um, so there's enormous opportunity across a lot of sectors um, and where I think are just at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, where we can go, but really trying to focus on those early opportunities where we think there's the greatest risk and get greatest opportunity. That's so cool. I mean, and just the fact that you've gone, to, you had a really good acronym for it, but the advisor group, the TAG, the technical advisor oh, the, group. Yeah, the X-TAG. Yeah, X-TAG, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, is that expert technical advisor? Exoskeleton. Exos Tech my apologies. Advisor group. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's cool, um, and I feel like that's that's a great way to identify new opportunities and one that I'm sure people are excited to participate in, which is just ask people that are doing it. I mean, it's it's obviously it's more complicated than that, and there's all sorts of logistics that I'm sure goes into it. But I mean, I, I feel like I don't know. I've been in situations where I've been asked to evaluate a market from an ivory steeple, you know, where it's you can't really do that, and then I've been in other situations where I've been you know, in a manufacturing floor, talking to the people, putting something together, trying to figure out how they could be more effective. And you get so much more done, I think, in that way. Or, you know, like talking to different people that are using a thing, you know, or like, I mean, you'll learn things. So, I mean, there's a product, uh, I probably shouldn't say what it was, but <laughs> it was, um, it, it, was a, it was a device that, you know, gave some metrics on a worker and I mean, people started seating it off the charger so it wouldn't charge correctly because they didn't want to, their boss snooping on everything they were doing. And you never would have figured that out if you didn't go into the field and, you know, start, you know, looking at trends and, you know, clipboarding it up as it were. So I don't know. I feel like that's, that's a wise approach. Well, you know, it's interesting the things you learn because you learn a lot about your product and your approach as well, right? There were times when we thought, oh yeah, this will absolutely work. And you get out in the phone and you're like, yeah, no way. Um, we either have to change our approach or the workflow has to change. I mean, and there's things when you even talk to somebody, they live it every day, right? And so they forget things that really might make a material difference. So when you're out with fresh eyes looking at it, you go, oh wait, that person just did X, Y, Z. And they go, oh yeah. I mean, it would be funny. We'd be on tours and they'd say, you know, you'd hear all their safety things and you, they'd given you the list of, oh no, we have this lift and team lifts. And if it's over, <laughs> this, you have to do this. and they have all these tools and you're like, okay. And you'd be standing there watching a guy or girl pick up this thing and go, there is no way that's 35 pounds. Yeah, of and course they, not. And they go, no, it's not. But the um, the lift assist is way on the other side of the room. <laughs> and it'll take two minutes for it to get here. And they don't want to wait. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so now we know that part. So yeah, that being able to see, um, because you'll see things that either they forget or it's not part of what is supposed to be happening, but really is happening. Yeah, or they, they don't want to self-report in those cases, I would think, you know, which, I mean, I'm guessing they they probably didn't get in trouble for the information you learned, but it's still, you know, you're able to move the product forward in some helpful way. Yeah, definitely. I've got a hunch, and, and you don't have to answer this, but did the ability to take your arms out of the exoskeleton and do a thing come out of one of those field visits, or was that designed in from the beginning? Um... You know, let me think about that for a minute. I think, honestly, it came about um, as part of the product development process when um, we were optimizing for um, some other things we were doing, and we found that that helped the operator and also gave them the, the additional utility. So the lockout was a almost like a sticky note accidentally, oh, great, this works 
perfect because it helps <laughs> other things. Um, and part of it was just really understanding what was happening. And we would have people say, but now I've done this part, or I want to hold this in place. As an example, something I never even thought about um, before I did this job, drywall and in, in construction, the things oh, that are heavy. Um, plywood, how awkward that is, right? You have to pick it up and there's a couple people and you have to stick it up against a wall and then somebody else to with a nail gun, right? Well, you know, I we not too long ago, our um, exoskeleton operator just picked it up with one hand and stuck it there. And then, you know, it was like, it was, like it was nothing, but those awkwardly shaped and, and they're heavy. And if you think about somebody doing that all day long, yeah. um, it becomes... But can you imagine trying to automate a construction environment like that? It's not something you could easily do. Yeah, no, it's tricky. I mean, we looked at a certain oil and gas application a while ago where just the amount of clutter on the site was so great. You couldn't get, I mean, it was difficult to get machines in there without, <laughs> you know, any, any kind of human pilot. Like it was just too many wires and, you know, shit that wasn't there the day before. <laughs> Yeah. In path and all this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> exactly. That is, is, there's the thing that they tell you how things are, and then there's the reality, and you're like, wow, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense to me. But what I found is humans are extraordinarily creative and ingenious, and I've been places and I go, wow, I would have never thought of that. Um, one of our <laughs> earlier products, The Guardian. As it's a inspection robot and went out and when they're doing pre-commissioning of um, in oil and gas midstream of their plants um, they have to go through and check all the lines to make sure there's somebody didn't leave their tools there right because they can make sense that. well some of the way they inspect some of the pipes is they put somebody on a skateboard laying down and send it through <laughs> there is no way <laughs> there's no way but they didn't have a better solution so um Jeez. yeah it's amazing the what people will figure out how to get it done one how do you another. extract your tools from that position because i mean well they they'd have them attached to a you know rope like okay that makes sense so they can pull them back out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that you yeah, don't but, want to go back in there. I mean, it's claustrophobic as <laughs> all. Oh, exactly. It wouldn't be me. Let's just say. I'm actually Those looking at something here in the in the office that required crawling through uh, an 18 inch diameter tube, and that was nobody wanted to do that job. <laughs> so. Yeah. No. People do some amazing things. Um, it, it's really fascinating, but we we do try everything we can to figure out how to solve that problem and help them get through the day uh, the same way they started the day, healthy and and not in physical pain. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And it, it seems like you're doing it with the, with the whole Guardian series. Um, I've, I have so many technical questions I want to ask, but it doesn't seem like the best direction to go in. So, I mean, with, uh, you know, I could. So I, I guess with... Um, Okay, so the lockout function still seems really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that's just electromechanical braking, and then you've got some sort of a safety system to make sure it stays locked out. Uh, let's see. That's a good question. Um, I think you're spot on. I'd have to dig into those details to you know the actual how they do it. Um, but yeah, it is a, a braking mechanism. That's cool. So that means that the platform then is is statically stable which is pretty unique for i know not all exoskeletons are able to do that so that's that's incredible i'm sure it gets their power use way down as well yes there's lots of very cool things that we've implemented um we i think we announced it not too long ago um the exoskeleton can stand on its own self-balancing and and that through software and ai and and that was came about um, really truly because we want to make it as safe as possible. So we didn't want it to, you know, move in the wrong direction or hit somebody. So it won't fall over. It kind of balances itself. So there's nice. some pretty good things about. So uh, 
Wait, if you if you cut power then, like completely, like took out the batteries, it would fall over. No, it would it would lock in place. That's pretty cool. <laughs> we don't want people to get hurt. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just it's one thing to say that; it's another to actually be able to do it. I mean that. And something that's got the dexterity you're talking about. I mean, I'm sure you know this already, but that's a really difficult, it can, can be a really difficult thing to do and, and still be able to re- maintain that range of motion. Because, I mean, I don't know, for people listening, like I, I would think your center of mass wants to go outside your polygon of support quite a bit and to track that and, and rein it in and have a stable base. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, part of the design principle and um, when we're developing the exoskeleton and we have other products too, I'm probably going to get, why didn't you talk about all these other things? But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really designed, um, it, the ease of use was really super important. And so it's designed to operate as an extension of the human. And that's why the kinematic equivalency was so important is when you see it operating, if you see the videos, I think some people think that the person inside is pushing and pulling and moving the exo. They're not. Um, there's sensors throughout the suit. We call it the get out of the way controls. But what happens is the guardian exo is trying to stay out of the human's way. So as the person is moving within 100 milliseconds, the robot is automatically just staying a certain equidistance away from your body part. So it's just moving in reaction to you. It's not, you're not pushing, you're not pulling. So you don't have to think about it. You're just doing what you would do to perform the task. And the robot is following your motions and doing Just to make sure I'm tracking, your arms aren't actually making physical contact with the inside of the robot when you're, when you're driving it. It's holding on to the, there's a uh, little handles on the inside of the, where the end effectors are. Um, so, and that's part of the controls, like you can um, put in the lock, lock the arms and, but that, those aren't forcing the arms to move. That's really just controls uh, on the power more. Cool. That yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I would think you'd want something like that for that lock function. So it's super <laughs> duper deliberate. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's not there to, you know, it's not like there's a joystick in there saying move arm right, move arm left. It's not doing that at all. It's really just following your motions as a human. Um, but the, there is uh, controls within there to, to hold the, in a certain condition. Yeah, that's that's super cool. So you, you sort of alluded to some of the other product line. Uh, is that anything anything else that you feel like is, is worth talking about? We don't have to go as deep if you don't want. No, no problem at all. Well, we talked about the Guardian XT, which is a variant of the Guardian XO, right? The top half, and it's tele-operated, so you can be remote. Um, It also has an up to 200-pound lift capacity. Uh, So if you're doing heavy things up in a bucket, you could do those things. And then, obviously, with the acquisition of RE Squared, we have the whole Sapien product line. And um, there's a number of different industries that, um, they were pursuing that we're also now as a unified team pursuing. Awesome. Um, so it really expanded our, our footprint and opportunity in new markets. And what we're looking to do is, you know, it takes a lot to bring teams together. We were both, um, about the same size in terms of number of people. Um, and, um, making sure we we don't miss anything as it relates to existing customer agreements and so we've been working hard against oh, uh, those items and while Imagine still arduous we meet product milestones so uh, really what we saw it as an opportunity to have a broader offering so there's the sapien line and in the sapien line um, there's a number of different uh, variants of the uh, arm that was of the sapien line and what we're looking to do is how to how we package those up for the segments that the app we're going after. So those are the three kind of core um, that we're focused on. But there's a number of programs that we've not announced that we're doing with Sweet. partners. And, and so uh, stay, to hear about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'd absolutely love to share as, as those things um, become publicly available and we're able to share. But uh, let's it's a lot in the works we have a lot of exciting opportunities ahead of us and a lot in in the pipeline sweet well that seems like a good note to end on uh anything else you want to plug or or 
bring up while you're on? Just um, now, I think this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward Likewise. to um, really changing the workforce of the future and seeing how we can help people along the way, keeping them safe, keeping them out of harm's way and enjoying the journey, figuring out what else is out there that uh, what other problems we'll be able to solve. Well, that's awesome, Christy. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, Christy Martindale, Chief Product Officer and Chief Marketing Officer for Sarcos Robotics. Um, check them out if you haven't yet. Uh, awesome company. Um, yeah, publicly traded. Very exciting stuff. Uh, one of the coolest robotics companies out there, in my opinion. And if you made it this far, please subscribe. Thank you.